Pushing the boundaries of the human mind and body is a topic that has fascinated me for a very long time. Perhaps it's because it reveals how much we take things for granted in our day-to-day -day lives. It's only when they're absent in our lives is when we finally realize their value. In this instance, I'm curious about time. What would happen to us if there was no way to tell the time? I'm not just referring to the watch on your wrist, also to the sun, the moon, and even the stars. What if there was absolutely no way to indicate the time? Before we continue, let's give a shout out to today's sponsor, Babbel. If you don't know, Babbel is a top tier language learning app that's making waves worldwide. But what makes it so different from the other competitors? Well, it's got the academic seal of approval, backed by researchers from Yale University and Michigan State University. They found it to be a powerhouse when it comes to language learning, with learners able to speak their chosen language in just three months. Plus, it's all about real-world practicality, covering everything from travel to business and more. Here's a quick fun fact for you. Bilingual folks tend to have more gray matter and white matter in their brains. In simple terms, their brains are wired for peak performance and learning, unlike those of us who speak with just one language. When I stumbled upon this nugget of information, I was absolutely fascinated, which is why I'm thrilled to have Babbel as a sponsor for today's episode. Now, what really sets Babbel apart is the fact that it's designed by actual language teachers. This means you're getting lessons that are thoughtfully crafted to help you become fluent in your chosen language. And that's not all. Babbel even offers live classes. If you sign up using links in the description or pinned comments, you'll snack two free live classes with your subscription. Speaking of subscriptions, Babbel has a variety of options to cater to your specific needs. And here's the cherry on top. As a special treat for my viewers, when you sign up through our partnership, you'll get a whopping 60% off. Plus, there's no risk involved thanks to Babbel's 20-day money-back guarantee. Big thanks to Babbel for making this episode possible. Now, let's dive right back into the video. In 1961, French geologist Michel Sif, who's also an avid cave explorer, discovered an underground glacier in the Alps along with his team. Initially, he intended to study the glacier for a 15-day duration. However, as months went by, his ideas became grander and he decided to extend his stay to two months. Instead of just studying the glacier, he had an even more ambitious idea something that had yet to be proven at that time. Essentially, the same question I posed at the beginning. What if there was absolutely no way to tell the time? Now, how did he come up with this idea? It was the height of the space race when both NASA and the Soviet space program were competing to dominate space exploration. At that time, we knew very little about human capabilities in space, so it made perfect sense for Michelle to seize the opportunity to find out what would happen. Eventually, he secured funding from NASA and the following year, he began his experiment. He entered the cave using a rope ladder, descending slowly into the dark icy depths to study something no humans had ever done before. Embarking on such an incredible journey required not only an unbelievable level of determination and courage, but also a profound level of passion. The journey into the cave which curved into an S-shape could have easily shaken Michelle's spirit, but it didn't. His mission was to keep his team on the surface informed about his well-being and his estimation of the time through a one-way telephone. So. How do you think he did? In just a month, 
His team informed him that the experiment was over. Michelle was baffled because there was supposed to be another month left to go. But in reality, Michelle's estimation of the time was off by 25 days. My body chose by itself when to sleep and when to eat. That's very important. We showed that my sleep and wake cycle was not 24 hours, like people on the surface on the earth, but slightly longer, about 24 hours and 30 minutes. But the important thing is that we proved that there was an internal clock independent of the natural terrestrial day and night cycle. Interestingly, during the subsequent experiments I did with other research subjects, all of the people in the caves showed cycles longer than 24 hours. In fact, it became common for them to achieve cycles lasting for 48 hours. They would have 36 hours of continuous activity followed by 12 to 14 hours of sleep. After we made that discovery, the French army gave me lots of funding. They wanted me to analyze how it would be possible for a soldier to double his wakeful activity. His experiment was such a monumental success that it attracted substantial funding from numerous institutions to conduct an even more ambitious expedition. But what amazes me even more is how he opened up a new field of study, chronobiology which completely changed our understanding that our bodies operate solely within a 24-hour cycle. Moreover, here's what he looked like when he got out of the cave. Quite an uncanny resemblance to an astronaut, don't you think? Now, if you've been a long-time viewer of my channel, you would know that the experiments I feature usually take a morbid turn, and this one is no different. Thanks to the available documentary footage, we can now get a glimpse of how the experiment was prepared and gain insights into Michelle's daily life. We can observe the challenges he faced not only in reaching the site of his tent, but also in transporting his equipment, food, and water. Once everything was finally set up, Michelle bid his farewells and descended into the cave just as he had done a decade ago. Michelle's days followed a set morning routine. As soon as he woke up, he had to telephone his team above ground to inform them that he was awake. Immediately, the lights would be turned on, controlled by the researchers, signifying the start of his day. Michelle had a four-hour regimen of daily experiments, including taking his blood pressure and conducting a series of mental, memory, and physical tests. He also used a pellet gun for five rounds of target practice. Beyond these activities, the rest of his day was his to fill. This time, Michelle brought along a record player so he could listen to music and read books. He would explore the cave and occasionally, he would clean by sweeping the floor to remove bed droppings and maintain a clean living space. His first few months in the cave appeared delightful, even for Michelle, aside from the minor nuisance when he could hear mice at night. This proved to be momentary as the traps he set up for them were highly effective and it wiped off their entire population. When he was ready to sleep, he'd again contact his team and they would turn off the light. Essentially, this was his daily routine, repeated over and over again until the experiment concluded. At least, that's what he hoped would be the case. It became that way for a while when an unexpected setback made his stay an unbearable experience. The damp condition of the cave caused his stereo, his books, and his science equipment affected by the mold. Michelle's only form of entertainment was gone. Other than doing his daily tasks, he literally didn't have anything else to do. The days grew longer, and his expedition, which he once looked forward to in the beginning, started to affect him in the worst way possible. He longed for company, but didn't have anybody to talk to. He began to feel resentful every time he looked at his phone because he couldn't talk to anyone. 
Remember the family of mice he wiped out in the beginning? He began to feel remorseful for them because if he had not killed them, he would at least have a living being to have him company. Which is why on day 162, when he heard a noise and realized that another mouse had come to visit, he was ecstatic. Another living creature exists in Midnight Cave, he wrote in his journal. If I trap this rodent, I will have a companion. For eight days, Michelle's time was consumed trying to catch and tame the mouse. He used a pea, then some jam placed beneath a propped up casserole dish. The mouse, named Mus by Sif, was timid and avoided capture. Finally, when Mus was caught, here's what happened. My patience prevails. After much hesitation, Mus edges up to the jam. I admire his little shining eyes, his sleek coat. I slam down the dish. He's captured. At last, I will have a companion in my solitude. My heart pounds with excitement. For the first time since entering the cave, I feel a surge of joy. Carefully, I inch up the casserole. I hear small squeaks of distress. Mus lies on his side. The edge of the descending dish apparently caught him on the head. I stare at him with swelling grief. The whispers die away. His still. Desolation overwhelms me. Michelle felt empty. He began to feel like the reason why he stayed in the cave was slipping away from him. With no indication of the experiment nearing its end, Michelle began to lose hope. Nine real days later, fortunately, Michelle's six months of isolation came to an end on August 10th. Although he had to remain underground for almost four more weeks for further tests, he was finally joined by scientists. To say that Michelle was overjoyed would be an understatement. Upon emerging from the cave on September 5th, Michelle found himself a changed man. His eyesight had deteriorated. He developed a chronic squint and experienced some psychological troubles. In the end, Michelle's experiment showed that he settled into sleep-wake patterns that were just a bit longer than the usual 24-hour day, similar to what happened in his first expedition. However, as time passed, his sleep-wake cycles became more unpredictable, ranging from as short as 18 hours to as long as 52 hours. What's intriguing is that there seemed to be a connection between the number of dreams during sleep and the length of one's waking periods. Roughly for every extra 10 minutes of daily activity, you would gain an extra minute of REM sleep. Additionally, the more you dreamt, the quicker your reaction time became when you woke up. This discovery even led the French military to explore drugs that could boost dreaming, with the hope of stretching soldiers' active hours to 30 or more. Ever since then, Michel continued to contribute to our understanding of the human chronobiology and has conducted expeditions involving other explorers. These extraordinary experiments serve as a testament to the remarkable nature of humanity. In a pursuit to understand our own body, we venture into the unknown and adopt unconventional practices. But at the same time, it's important to know our own limits because one of Michelle's expeditions in 1988, which involved the participation of a brave explorer, had such a heavy toll on her that her well-being was affected even after the expedition. Although she broke the record for the most amount of time spent alone in an underground cavern by a woman staying for 111 days, tragically, on 18th January 1990, she was discovered lifeless in her car, succumbing to a barbiturate overdose. During the experiment, she astonished observers by sleeping extraordinarily long hours, once logging a 31-hour slumber, and even nodding off for an astonishing 18 hours during one afternoon, which she believed lasted mere minutes. On average, she fell into a routine of 20 hours asleep, followed by 30 hours awake throughout the experiment. While Michel relied on his internal clock, gauging his activities by his fatigue, Veronique kept time through her menstrual cycle. Normally a 28 to 30 day cycle, it remarkably shortened to 18 and eventually 11 days during her confinement. 
The true cause of her death has been confirmed, but the mystery lies in her thoughts during those moments. The only hint we have comes from her book, Alone at the Bottom of the Pit, where she delves into her fear of staying in hibernation.